so much for coming. Uh, my name's Pete Brad. Um, I'm uh, here representing Startup Oz today. We're uh, streaming live from Fishburners in Ultimo. Uh, we've got Peter Dunn here today to explain the employee option documents and the safe harbour valuation uh, documents that uh, he drafted along with uh, quite a lot of input from um, a number of other professional services firms. Um, and the government spent a lot of time going around and discussing these documents uh, with different stakeholders. The aim of today is to have Peter explain the documents to uh, people at accelerators, incubators, um, uh, and co-working spaces around Australia to try and get the, uh, the leaders of those organisations to agree to, in principle, to, to, um, to want to share them um, when they're released on July 1. Um, and we've still got a bit of time if there are any sort of mission critical changes that are needed uh, to give back to the government uh, early next week. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Peter. Thanks for coming. Th thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, maybe we might just give one minute overview of the, of the process and then talk about the documentation uh, and perhaps sort of uh, try to mention that which we were trying to achieve, achieve with the, the process. So I actually think this has been a really great initiative uh, by the government uh, to make it easier uh, in the startup space. Uh, before this legislation uh, comes into effect, you have a, a sort of a harder path to get clarity around the treatment of options uh, or shares or grants to employees. Um, and I, I think it was perceived appropriately that that, that, was, that clunkiness needed to be addressed. And so there, there's now clarity of tax treatment in to, uh, it, for the issue of options to employees, provided you meet certain criteria. And again, the legislation is driven at the startup community. Um, Greenwoods and, and Freehills are sort of affiliated tax practice with Freehills. I've uh, been advising the ATO on, on the tax changes and I think it's done a great job. Uh, and Freehills we were brought in to help with the standard documentation. So again, the tax office wanted to put forward a suite of documents that didn't have to be used. So people don't have to use these to get the benefit of the tax treatment if they satisfy the criteria. But it's a model plan that if people wanted to, can be used. And I, I think if you've had any exposure to the US system, you know that in certain respects they have uh, sort of more formulaic standard document approach to certain elements. Which, which has cut costs where there shouldn't be costs incurred. And so um, we've drafted two documents and that's primarily what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the first is a, uh, an, an offer letter to employees. So this is the, the individualist style letter that goes to each of an organization's employees. Um, and, and the purpose with doing it this way, an offer letter and then the plan itself, was that you may not want to have complete uh, visibility to all the employees in terms of what each other is getting. So the letter has the organisation saying this is the number of options you're getting, this is the exercise price, these are the vesting conditions, and then it points people to the option plan which sets out the rules. Again, it's meant to be streamlined. Um, we're also sort of contemplating that there may be organisations that, that really read the plan in detail uh, and make changes, but there may be organisations who print it off perhaps don't read it in a lot of detail. So we wanted to kind of work and, and protect an entity that was building and growing something and wanted to implement an employee share option plan to have basic protections so that down the track they didn't feel like, gee, we didn't know about that and why is that in there? So the, the offer letter has a bit of input, individuals, name goes in and the number of options they get and then it directs people to the option plan itself. This is about a 20 page document that's been uh, a round of consultation with industry figures uh, and then there's still some consultation coming in uh, and the ATO uh, I think has an, uh, until early next week for further comments to be considered and that'll be fed back to us and we'll get directions from the ATO as to what they want to put in here. Um, but what we sought to do again was to protect the organisation and get a balance for the employees and we've had regard to that which we've done um, in, you know, in, in the marketplace and, and I guess to give you a, one minute of um, sort of my experience to hopefully save a, a, some frame of reference to do this. I've um, acted in the technology space for the last six years in Australia for companies like Atlassian, Campaign Monitor, uh, done capital raisings for big commerce, page up people, uh, and was involved in the capital raisings at Oz Forex and 99 Design. So um, the, the plan rules that are put in place here have regards to that which you know, we've used in, uh, in, in, in the market. Um, it, it, in some respects, it's a slightly mechanical document, but uh, it has kind of th three main concepts. One is when do the, the options vest? Um, and again, we had regard to the, the US uh, model there. Uh, and, and one common approach is to say options vest over four years, 25% uh, of the end of year one, 
uh, and then the remainder over a three-year period on a monthly basis. Now, people don't have to follow that, and if they want to adopt a different vesting regime, the documents say they can do that. That's the default if they don't specify one. And there's capacity for the board to vary it down the track, and, and none of those actions will have an adverse tax outcome. So, again, it's to put in something as a start, starting point, but you don't have to stick to that. We have had some feedback, which I think has been quite good, about the administrative hurdle of having to say to people each month, oh, another six options are vested. And I think one of the enhancements we're going to make in the, the next draft is to say that the options may vest over a particular cycle, but the company doesn't need to update other than on a six monthly or annual basis, just to avoid every month you having to say to employees another four uh, have vested. Um, once you get past the vesting regime, there's some mechanics around the exercise. But I, but I always sort of think, that, as I say, there's sort of three elements. One is, if I'm seeking to incentivise a particular employee, then that person needs to get the options and they can't sell them on. Uh, it's it's that's per, that person I want to engage. So there's a restriction on the disposal of options and there's a tax requirement, which I'll come on to in a few minutes, uh, around disposal of options. But there's a restriction on disposal of options uh, and then equally the company itself needs to uh, have regard to the fact that an employee may leave, so it needs to have the ability to get the options back if the employee does leave. And, and the vesting regime works such that options that have vested when an employee leaves can be bought back for their fair value, unvested options lapse. Again, people have got the flexibility if they want to change that, but that's the starting position. Um, I think the other thing is uh, anyone who's worked in venture capital or private equity knows you, you need to have the ability to implement an exit transaction, be it a sale, if Google comes along and says, I just need to buy this business, they'll want to buy 100% uh, or an IPO. And so the documents confer the power on the board to require the option holders to give effect to one of those transactions. Um, and uh, often it's the case, uh, certainly with later stage companies, you'll have an option plan and then a shareholders agreement. When you exercise the options, you then become a shareholder and you are governed by the shareholders agreement. We put something in here that says, if someone exercises the options and there isn't a shareholders agreement, then the regime around disposal, no disposal, and the regime around if there's an exit, you must sell if the board requires you to, still continues to apply. So again, it's trying to protect a company who may have inadvertently not put a shareholders agreement in place and doesn't have a situation where there's an option holder who then says, well, actually, I'm not going to comply now or I'm leaving the company and you can't get my options back. So this is meant to really cover the employee relationship for the duration of, of, of the journey. Um, I'm trying to think if, if there's anything else I sort of really need to, 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 to mention to you. Uh, the, there is a clause in the document, Clause 6, Procedure on an Exit Event. That's quite a detailed clause, and it also deals with listing in Clause 7 and then a reorganisation event. And again, that's to give maximum flexibility to the board of the company to effectively do that which is in the best interest of the company and not have a particular option holder block it. So a little bit of detail, but we've come at this from a perspective of how do you ensure the company isn't disadvantaged because the documentation doesn't quite work. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, that, that's, that's sort of it. So on the documentation, I'll just say one word around where the, the tax legislation's up to. It's been tabled before Parliament. Uh, there are some final discussions around whether the, there's any tweaking required to it. Uh, and it's fair to say some people are uh, still requesting that some changes need to be made. Um, one of the uh, provisions under the Act at the moment is that um, you only get the benefit of the favourable tax treatment if the options are not disposed for three years, uh, unless there's a whole of company sale. Um, and I think we can think of examples where you may have a partial exit. You may actually want to sell part of the company and, and want the employees to have the ability to sell some of their shares in connection with that. The best example I can give you is early stage company gets Series A funding. Series A investor stays along for two years and then says, I need to get an exit now. The company's going really well, it wants to bring in another investor. And, and we've certainly seen situations where it's appropriate for the employees to say, and the founders, well, hang on, you, the Series A investor, are making a good return now. We should be able to re realise some value now. We're not going to sell out completely because the new investor is going to need us to continue on, but we want to re realise some value. So that, that discussion is still going on uh, with the ATO, um, or with, certainly with people putting forward uh, submissions as to that requirement, and we'll see the way that works out. But, uh, but again, I think it's a, it actually is a very positive initiative because if you fit within the regime, then you can issue an instrument to employees that they get uh, a capital gains tax treatment if they hold it for 12 months. There's no uncertainty around whether they're going to be taxed on day one on an income basis, and that was the problem with the old regime where you're a startup 
You may not have a heap of free cash. You may want to incentivise with options, or you may actually say, well, I've, I've got to recruit people who get a job in Silicon Valley, and they're going to get options there, so I need to give them options. And gee, if I give them an option, they get taxed on it, even though there may not be an exit. And they get taxed now at income basis. It doesn't help me that they could claim that back in the future if it never comes off. That's a bad result. So this ameliorates that. Again, it's, it, it is a really strong uh, policy initiative. Uh, and the, the documentation is designed to be something that people can use but don't have to. Um, and as I say, uh, provisions put in to try to ensure that the company that's doing the right thing by its workforce isn't then disadvantaged with a, a sort of a gap in the documentation. So um, happy to get any, any questions, equally happy if people want to email and say we're not quite sure whether this works or not. Um, I did get some comments early on that it was too long and could we have it at two pages and in an ideal world we would, but you are actually giving someone a property right, a, a share uh, in the company, they become an equity owner in one sense, not just an employee, and you really need to make sure that you've got control of that relationship down the track, because who knows what can happen two, three, four years down. So I wish it could be a little bit shorter, but we hope we get the balance right. to people on the Hangout, um, the audio wasn't working um, for the first couple of minutes. We have recorded it and we will upload it to our YouTube channel so you can watch, uh, watch the, the staff again. Um, the staff again. Um, I suppose some of the, the questions um, at the last round table I was at in terms of the stuff that left out, and you may have covered it, I was a bit distracted trying to get the audio to work, but it's the good lever, bad lever provisions. Um, where did we get up to with that? Oh, actually, you, sorry, you're, you're quite right, Peter. We, um, I didn't focus on that. Um, I guess people may be aware that um, commonly there is what's called a good lever, bad lever clause. Uh, and we do make a note in here. Um, and the sort of genesis of good lever, bad lever is, um, and I think it has more regard to a later stage buyout transaction, but you know, I, I, the, I think the rationale is I'm, I'm investing in this management team and I'm expecting you to be there or, until an exit for me. Uh, and, and if you leave, I get the shares back. Um, and, and the argument is it's never about whether I get them back or not. I always get the ability to bring the shares back. I don't want someone who's now working for a competitor being a shareholder. I may need those shares to incentivise someone who's got to replace the person who's left. So it's never an argument about whether I get the shares back. It's just a discussion of price. And practice developed, certainly in the private equity industry, and then it flowed through into venture capital, which is pretty analogous in early stage of what's called good lever, bad lever. So um, the price in that circumstance where you've left depends on whether you're a good lever or a bad lever. Um, and traditionally, good lever is if your employment's been terminated for no cause or because of ill health or, or incapacity. But if you just start, decide I'm going to leave or your employment is terminated for, for bad stuff like fraud, then that circumstance, you're a bad lever. And there's a price differential. Good lever, fair value. Bad lever, sometimes expressed as at the issue price or a discount to fair value. Um, I, I, it's my own view, and I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but if, if you have a vesting regime and I say to you, if you remain as an employee for this period of time and the options vest, then in one sense you've earned them or, and you should have the economic entitlement to them. And, and I, I actually think that a vesting regime sh works like that. And then, it, But if you leave, those that haven't vested fall away because you haven't, you haven't fulfilled your part of the bargain for those to, to generate. So again, someone leaves after 12 months, 25% vest. The way the option plan works at the moment is when you leave, then they get paid out at fair value regardless of the manner within which you leave. But we flag up people may want to build in effectively a discount concept. If you leave in certain circumstances, yes, I can buy them back and the price is at a discount to fair value. Uh, and it's, I guess it's a philosophical um, approach that people want to take. And I think really what you're doing then is you're saying, yes, there's a vesting regime, but in addition to that, there's a, there's a sort of economic vesting component that means you've got to not leave in a bad circumstance. And if you do, there's a sort of price differential. So, but at the moment, there is, there's a note in here that we haven't built in a good lever, bad lever pricing regime, but people are free to do that. And again, that will not change the tax outcome. Um, and one of the other comments in our um, session, and we ended up, um, uh, I think it was Deb from Deep Chile, um, brought the point up was could we write it in more plain English and said uh, pointed out that um, that means that employers don't get to agree on some of the terms if it's in plain English and it could have a worse outcome. What, where did we end up to on, on that point? Yeah, there's, um, it's, 
It's a, it's a good question. It, it, um, Could you just repeat the question? Sorry, I apologise. Yeah, uh, Peter's just asked. There was a discussion uh, during um, one of the sessions with the, the federal minister who's responsible for this, chairing a discussion with industry uh, participants about whether the documents could be um, generated in a more plain English style. Um, and, and, you know, we hope to sort of start with that. Um, some of the concepts are uh, complicated and there is there's some complexity behind them. The best example I can give you is the offer letter acceptance form has the employee, when they accept, uh, appoint the, the board as that person's attorney to uh, do anything that is required of the employee under the documents. And, and the reason for that is if, if, let's say the company's gone along really well for five years and then Google comes and, or someone else comes and says, I really have to buy this company, it's great, I'm gonna offer you a great price. Well, the drag along provision says that the employees have to go along with what the board says, the board acting in the best interest of the company. But if an employee just actually says, well, I'm not gonna do that, or just is not around anymore, has left and can't be located, the mechanism is that the board can sign the transfer form on behalf of that person because of the power of attorney. And legally, you need the power of attorney to enable the board to give effect to the drag along. So th there is no um, disenfranchisement of employee rights. There's protections in there. The board has to approve it, same price per share effectively. But equally, you want to solve for the company not being green mailed, to put it bluntly, where someone says, I'm not signing. And so that mechanism is built in. Now, it's take me about a minute to explain it. There's a bit of complexity to the drafting. We've tried to express that um, as plainly as we can, but nevertheless, you, you need to get it right. And so, uh, picking up the comments from the last session where uh, I think it was Seb from Blue Chile who said, you know, can we, can we look at this issue and, and, you know, the usability of the documents, we sought to build in uh, some narrative boxes and some headings that kind of telegraph that's what this section is doing. So, um, at the start of the plan, once you get through the introductory comments, you, you've got a summary that says, Section one sets out how the plan is administered and that gives the board the power. Section two deals with the mechanics of vesting. Section three, so a little bit of a roadmap. So again, very happy uh, if people think there is too much complexity here or the language needs to be, you know, have another go at making it a little bit simpler. But um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll try to get the balance right. So I suppose um, the, the point from uh, Seb was that if the language is made in plain English, it could lead to some, um, some issues in the future um, around people arguing over what the terms were, whereas if they were left in uh, legal language, uh, the lawyers could at least uh, confirm what their understanding was um, and that would, that would save things. Where do we get to, and you may have mentioned this at the very beginning, um, with the valuation. So uh, in that meeting, there was like a, a time curve and there were, we were discussing different uh, sort of safe harbor valuations. Did you cover that at the beginning? Uh, no, and I, and I sort of apologize. One of the uh, senior guys from Greenwoods, the tax advisor has been working on this. I was having some difficulty sort of dialing in. I was going to get him to, to give a bit of an overview to the, the tax components. But um, one thing the legislation does do is it, um, it tries to recognize that at an early stage uh, or startup phase, you really don't want to be spending money um, getting evaluation done. Um, and in some respects, given where the company's at at an early stage, you know, what, what will evaluation, what value will that process give? And so it, the legislation puts forward some valuation safe harbours. Um, take one step back, the way the legislation works is uh, you get the favourable tax treatment if you issue the options uh, on the basis of the exercise price. So you issue them today with an exercise price that's referable to the market value today. And so how do you determine market value? And for the first sort of three years, provided certain revenue hurdles aren't exceeded, it's just a net asset test, so really a balance sheet test. So it gives the company uh, a lot of clarity that they can issue, have certainty around where they need to set the exercise price and then not have an anxiety around do we need to get a valuation. Um, I think the point Peter makes is the legislation has to contemplate that companies, you know, over a 10 year period could get the benefit of this and during that period, their financial position will change hopefully for the, for the, for the betterment. And so uh, one of the, uh, at a certain point, if the company has raised external capital and triggers one of the hurdles, then the capital raising uh, is the reference point for the, the market value test at the time of issue. Um, 
So I, again, I think the ATO has tried to, to do a good job in giving a number of safe harbour valuation paths that companies can say, well, we satisfy that criteria, that's how we put the exercise price, tick the box and we've got clarity and we can say to employees, you've now got this uh, appropriate favourable tax treatment. But again, you don't have to use the safe harbours. You know, if you think that there's a, a, a better way of getting the, the value of the company and you can justify it, you can go down that path. And at a future point in time, you may be called on to question, well, why was that the appropriate value? But the safe harbours do have the benefit of giving complete clarity that if you satisfy that, there isn't an after the fact need to justify. If, there, if anyone on the Hangout wants to ask any questions, just email them through to me um, and I'll um, have a look at them and we might be able to ask Peter. Uh, Peter, were there any other things that are sort of um, still being decided upon? So I, I know you've, um, at the very beginning, you mentioned what Adrian said around uh, the tax um, and three-year rule. Is there anything else that's still in draft or...? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good question. So it's still an exercise of collating comments where people have said, um, you know, can you look at this clause? And so th I think there'll be one final uh, edit to the documents and then they'll be issued by the, um, the tax office. A very good comment came in around the whole vesting concept, you know, the, the administrative hurdle of every month having to send people another notice that says, you know, another four options are vested. So some really good comments. So the, the documentation is still being refined, and I think that's really positive to get different views from people. The, there is the three-year question where, at the moment, if options were to be disposed within three years, other than a whole company sale, then that means you're outside the the favourable tax treatment, and so there's a, unless the Commissioner uh, approves the sale within that three year period. So there's a discussion going on on that. And probably the only other point to bear in mind is that um, when, if, if anyone uh, says I want to issue some securities, be it an option or a share or um, an RSU, under Australian corporations law, if you're issuing it to an Australian resident, you need to ensure that um, you satisfy the, the prospectus rule or prospectus exemption rules. So, Certainly at a startup phase, you don't want to be incurring the cost of doing a prospectus. So you need to fall within one of the exemptions. And one of the exemptions is effectively an ASIC class order. Uh, and that class order has certain requirements. So if you meet those requirements, you don't need an offer document for employees. And the benefit for that is you reduce a lot of cost and complexity. Um, the class order uh, has as one of its uh, core pieces that the value of the options being issued uh, can't be above $5,000. Uh, and I think there's a discussion going on around whether that's the appropriate limit. Uh, and I think, certainly in a startup phase, you can run an argument that uh, it's un you're unlikely to issue options uh, you know, above that price to any particular individual. But one can see a situation where, as the company starts to grow, it may need to bring in, say, a, a, a chief finance officer or a you know, chief marketing officer or someone quite senior where you need to give them a substantive amount of, of uh, options and you may go above that. So that, I think that's the other main point that's being worked through. Do you guys have any questions in the audience here? Yeah? Yeah. Just repeat your question. Thank yeah, it's just a, a question for Floor, thank you, it was whether the government will be uh, releasing any additional information uh, or supporting documentation? The short answer is yes. We're actually um, doing a little bit of work and Treasury's doing a lot of work uh, on a, a sort of an explanation pack that'll sit around it. So whilst the plan itself has some notes in it, um, and, and that's designed to hopefully address the situation where someone late at night just prints it off and says, I'm gonna use it. But th there uh, is to be a couple of documents that'll sit around that'll explain uh, a little bit more eloquently than I've done today this is the way the two documents work and this is the process. Uh, and, and, you know, put in place some signposts. So if you're issuing an option, you need to make sure you're in one of the safe harbours, the prospectus rules, you know, et cetera. Uh, an, a, an overview of the tax treatment and what you need to do to fall within that regime. And then also a, a bit of a roadmap as to how to implement. But, yep. Um, awesome, thanks very much. Um, also, one of the aims is for the community to start using them a lot more. And what I've seen uh, at Fishburners and I like when people have used standardised software or, 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 or documents like this is they can explain them to each other. Um, and if your employee comes on board and they're at, you know, you've got other employees at other companies in Fishburners, they can, uh, those employees can help uh, you make your employees comfortable with the documents and how it works. Just got a few more people to sort of explain it in plain language.
Um, so that's one of the aims of, of today's session was to try and get as many of Australia's hubs recommending these documents as possible to, um, to increase uh, that sharing. Um, well, I haven't had any questions come in um, from the Hangout. Um, so uh, I'll, do you, if you don't have any other comments? No, thank no, you. No, I think, um, well, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, um, if anyone does email any uh, questions over, I can email them to Peter on your behalf. Um, and uh, we'll also be uploading a, um, a professional copy of today's recording onto our YouTube channel. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Sorry, I, is, is that...